Yo, YouTube, I'm back, and today I'm speaking with a fan who's also a very interesting man, uh, and he's doing really cool things. In fact, his name is Cool. Please welcome Nate Cool. Nate, thank you for joining me here today, buddy. Thanks, Eddie. I appreciate it. Nate, you sent me an email several months ago, and I think that's how you and I started communicating, and it was probably over something a little Catholic because... You notice that you and I are both Catholic. I'm kind of new. But that's not even it. I connected with you because you're a cool dude. <laughs> and you're doing some really interesting things. Yeah. And so I'm going to just drop this bomb, but then I'm going to let you pick up the pieces. Uh, Nate is a father of many children. Uh, did you say you had nine? Ten, actually. She's three uh, weeks old now. Ten. Okay. <laughs> so she's got a three. And how old is the oldest? Uh, Fourteen. Fourteen. All the same woman. Yes. God bless her soul and body. Yes, absolutely. Got, mm -hmm. So Nate's got 10 kids and also at the time of that email was living in a bus. And still. Okay. All right. So we got to catch up. But he drove his family of nine plus his pregnant wife <laughs> down from the, uh, the, the northwest of the U.S., I believe. And now he's de here in Florida in my old hometown. St. Pete. And so, Nate, tell us more about yourself, dude. All right. Well, uh, in more than just driving down from the Northwest, we are coming from Western Montana. Uh, I've actually, we've actually been traveling the United States for two years in our bus. And uh, it's a pretty interesting story how we got there. But uh, we've been traveling between monasteries, convents, uh, national parks, beaches and mountains for two years, just uh, following our Lord's calling with all the kids packed up. It's been pretty neat. <laughs> wow, that's um, that's quite a that's quite a lifestyle. I know that recently this idea of living in a schoolie has caught wind in just the climate of our time. I guess it's difficult for young people, and I even have a cousin and her fiance who are, have been living in a bus. And so it's almost like a, it's, in, it's, a, it's a sign of the time. I don't want to say it's trendy, but you're, you're right on time with where the world is going right now in many different ways, including the fact that you, you, you live a traditional life. You're not just a hippie in a bus or a, a Gen Zer who's trying to rebel against the system or broke millennial. You're a Christian man and you're on a mission. I am on a mission. Yes, we, uh, we started this journey mentally about 10 years ago. Um, we calculate that uh, by our children. That's pretty much how we keep track of the years. And that was the year my fourth <laughs> child was born. So yes. uh, that was, uh, her name's Grace. So that was our year of grace. The real, uh, the real turning point in our lives where we decided uh, we need to live our faith properly. You know, wh what is doing a self evaluation of what in our life is separated, separates us from your average Protestant protesting Catholicism? Because they go to church, we go to church, they say their prayers, we say our prayers. I work with an atheistic boss, so do they. I'm getting all the influence from all these. Uh, alphabet people all day long at work uh, and I'm, you know you can't not bring that home and so we started evaluating how can we bring our faith into every moment of our life and that started about 10 years ago and it really it took a lot of different shapes but it culminated in uh, what we like to call one of the greatest moments of our life which was Strangely enough, the government shutdowns. Yeah. <laughs> Where, yeah. That, that, that really was it. it. That was like, we've been thinking about getting on the road, thinking about minimal, minimalizing our life. We've been getting rid of all of the excesses over the years, um, getting rid of the have tos of the world. I have to go see the in laws, even when I know. You know, there's there's influences there that are not good. They're not Catholic, mm -hmm. not Christian. Um, and so we have been stepping away for quite a few years. And how old are you? When 
32. 34. <laughs> I'm 34. <laughs> okay, wow, interesting. So exactly 10 years ago, you were 24. Yep. You were having your fourth child at age 24. You had obviously been married. You were married before that. I, I got married at 19. You got married at 19. When did you meet your wife? Uh, when I was 15. How did you meet? At church. <laughs> okay, so you are someone who are, was raised in the church. You married a woman from the church. What is your up, upbringing like in that way? So I was raised, uh, I was raised Catholic. I am actually the fourth of nine children myself. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's that. Yeah. Uh, my parents, my, my parents love their faith, but mm -hmm. they know very little about it, if that makes sense. Oh, yes. Right. And so when I was young, uh, back in 4-H, you know, raising hogs. That's right. Uh, there, there were times that I would attend Protestant services with my buddies, and there, for instance, like the uh, the Baptist church down the road, they had way, way greater respect, way greater piety in their prayer than ever happened in my little English mass church. And so uh, I never quit going to church, and I never quit believing but I really didn't care that much about it until, uh, well, a couple of major experiences in the army when I was uh, right around 19, 20, 21. What were those experiences that led you back to the father? Well, one of them for sure was getting married and my wife had a very, very strong traditional Catholic upbringing. Man, that's and helpful. So Okay, very helpful. Yeah. Very helpful. Uh, the other was, with that upbringing, she was willing to follow my lead wherever I was going. And so actually having that responsibility, I needed to step up my game. Yeah. I was like, why am I doing this? I got another soul here to take care of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And that's pretty amazing. She looked to you as her head. And yes. being a woman of strong Catholic faith, she was willing to follow your lead. And yeah. I can't help but to believe that that's a big part of what's missing in the world today in terms of relationships. And why a guy like you could have such strong faith living on a bus with 10 kids and a wife that joyfully goes along and, and is fruitful in her uh, relationship to you. These kinds of things don't happen very much today. I think that's a part of, you know, my attraction to you also. And I think uh, there's, a, there's a strong momentum towards that today in our day of chaos because men and women and families are in need of stability. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you Agreed. radiate kind of stability. And I know <laughs> that you, that stability that you have is not from you it's from no. above you and that's why she follows your lead because you're a man of god yep god then wife then kids then career always st thomas aquinas wrote about it perfectly that is the order before the fall of man yeah we have it all kinds of backwards and discombobulated ways today that's a big part of the reason why things don't work so i'm curious what were you doing? Carry us along that journey between uh, getting married and then getting her on a bus and, and driving around the country. Okay. Well, um, we started with a big conversion point was actually a book by the Catholic author, Matthew Kelly. Mm -hmm. And in that book, we were reading together. We always read together. Um, <clears throat> the... He challenges the reader to take one week of their time and write down a pretty clear estimate, it doesn't have to be exact, an estimate of what amount of time you're spending on each activity throughout your day. Do that for one week. Calculate the numbers together and whatever you're spending the most amount of time on is your current God because time is the most valuable asset of life. Wow. Yeah. We did that 
and I realized God wasn't my God at that point in my life. Right. And so we started changing a lot of things. Uh, we started prioritizing my wife and I's time together. We started pri- over any other have tos of the world. Anybody else? Oh, you got to have your girl time. You got to have your guy time. It was like, no, we got to have our time because without us being unified, how can we raise our children unified? And without us being unified, we're giving each other to help each other get to heaven. And so if we're not prioritizing ourselves in our marriage, how can we possibly say we're prioritizing God? I find it so interesting that there are people who are married that they don't prioritize each other. In fact, there are those who prioritize their friends above their spouse. You know, I think of couples who go and speak about their problems, particularly women, to their friends rather than coming to the husband they'll they'll complain about the husband behind or their his back mother. or their mothers that's a huge mm-hmm. bre- yeah. deal breaker in a relationship is if when there's something troubling her she goes to her mom and the husband finds out about it second hand that's terrible yeah that's, that's a terrible big breach big breach of trust in a relationship yeah it is so you know i think you you mentioned how your parents um they were they were faithful but they just didn't understand their faith and you know this is understandable given that you know we're educated by the enemy in our world today and so it's yes. it's, it's challenging in fact you know it's it's why i would imagine god has extra grace or or mercy on us on our souls today because we we are so lost we have no sense of direction but we're also very led astray in every every aspect of the way of the way um, and so, you know, things like what we just spoke about happen. Relationships fall apart because they, they don't know how to have healthy biblical relationships, normal, natural, healthy relationships. Um, my question to you is, so now you have 10 children. First of all, okay, so you said the oldest was? 14. 14, wow. Oldest is 14. And what do you have there, boys, girls? What's the rundown? So the mix is uh, six to four, girls to boys. (laughs) Six to four, yeah, there seems to be a super abundance of female energy, both literally and figuratively on on our planet. Yeah, I got three girls and one boy. It's just overrun, overrun. The the women are outpacing (laughs) us in every regard, even even (laughs) popping up on the planet. So that's pretty cool. I'm happy that you have daughters because, um, you know, that means we should probably share a lot of things in terms of what we think is helpful in raising a daughter in this degenerate age. Anything, um, anything useful or different that you might share with me and others about, you know, raising children in this day? Um, yeah, actually. And I, this is a principle that my wife and I follow, uh, daily is, uh, the principle laid down by Saints Zeli and Louis Martin, the parents of, uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, Therese of the Little Rose. That's right. Um, and, her, and her parents said every aspect of their raising needs to be monitored by the parents and evaluated against God's law. Man. To include when they're playing, don't let them just play. You watch to make sure they're not building habits of mean words, they're not building habits of bullying or pushing. When neighbors or friends or people say, oh, your child's so cute, take the initiative to step forward and say, excuse me, please don't say that for the reason that you could very likely be building in this small sponge-like brain vanity, and then they have to fight that later in their life. So basically, you have to be, there's a difference between a helicopter parent and a fully engaged parent. A helicopter parent is trying to keep their kid from ever experiencing life, Mm. protect them. An engaged parent is trying to help that child flourish into a child of God, free of sin, not free of injury. Right. Amazing. Yeah. What a great distinction. You're not necessarily trying to save their bodies. You're trying to save their souls. Yeah. Death, judgment, heaven, hell. Four final things, man. What would you say to people that would argue with you about how extreme that is in terms of training your children? And you're a homeschooler, so they're getting a lot of you. Yes. Um, My first thing I would say is look at the end result. Look at the children of today 
who go to public school and go to friends' house sleepovers all the time and all of these things and look how they are involved in society. Look at the result. It's pretty clear. They're, they're, I mean, look, we're, we're living in the alphabet world where men can get pregnant and all this other junk. And this is the result. And then you look at traditional uh, God-centric couples and how their children interact in the world. It's night and day. There, there, there's incomparable differences of respect to elders, of self-discipline, of control of yourselves, of kindness and generosity towards others, um, how they dress, how they carry themselves. They're productive members of society. You were raised in a, you know, just to use the, the term radical, but very different way, I would imagine as well, being one of, you know, nine, you said? Nine. And yeah. um, having Catholic parents, you were raised where? Uh, I was in uh, Washington State. In Washington, in Washington State. So I want to say that, unlike a lot of us, you were you were you received an imprint with your childhood, your upbringing that was, uh, I guess you could say, uh, invigorated at the time of your you know reversion. You saying when you you know married your wife and whatnot. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Absolutely. And that's pretty powerful. And you just see the exact opposite of it in terms of secular society. For example, you know, parents who are, you know, my parents are from a different country, but Colleen's parents, my parents are the same age. Her parents were from the hippie generation. Grew, you know, they grew up, you know, playing rock and roll music, drinking, smoking, and having a lot of sex. And, you know, this is, this is my children's grandparents. <laughs> You say you right. come from several generations of conservative Catholic homes. The rest of us come from, you know, at least two generations of pure, degenerate, uh, de destructive ways of living, demonic ways of living. So you, you're, a, um, you're a relic in a way, but also a signpost. <laughs> yeah. Well, think, I mean, it makes sense. That just uh, emphasizes what you just said, emphasizes what I just said, which is look at the result. Right. Look at the graces I have been given because of my raising and because of how I'm raising my children versus, unfortunately, most people in the world today who have to start from scratch. I mean, the proof's in the pudding. <laughs> the I've proof will be from happen. scratch. Yeah. You know, I was raising my children in a very secular way uh, up until, you know, less than five years ago. And so I yeah. had to do, it's not as easy for me because I had to do a strong, hard pivot. And of course, you got to wait for everybody to follow along. Of course, I, you know, I'm lucky as well. God's grace is upon my marriage and that my wife is yeah. the way that she is too. And although she is not an easy bender, I know that with time and trust, she always follows my lead. Right, and so that's I just knew if wonderful. I was who I had to be. That's all that mattered. She would turn the corner. Right, right. Have a good having a good wife is key. It's so important. Uh, but then the children, yeah. you know, I'm kind of undoing a lot of damage because I gave them screens at a, at a very at an early age. You know, I didn't yep. know, and I really I didn't know it. I was I was foolish. Here, have these screens. And now. Not, I mean, things are much better now. A couple of years ago, since we brought them home from school, we're homeschooling now. I'm here. My my wife's here. We're together all day long. So there's a greater transference of the parents' uh, value and virtue rather than that of the world when they were going to even private schools. I was sending them to. I had to, I had to undo a lot of damage, brain damage, that my children receive because of the oh, yeah. crap that they're that they're exposed to. So if I had to do it all over again, of course, which doesn't make any sense, that's a silly argument. I am where uh -huh. I am and you are where you are, but that's why we're here together, you and me. But I would like to point to you for young men uh, who are open to a different way, a different path, a different uh, lifestyle for you and your family. And it's about a return to tradition. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Tra thank you for that. It's mm -hmm. uh. It, it isn't easy. It's no right. easier for me than it is for anybody else because the world's still influencing. The, 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 I mean, 
everywhere you go, every street corner, every ad, every billboard, every person you see at the gas station when you're at the pump, like the influence is still there. Yeah. But the things you can do in your life to move that way for those who are looking for a new way is prioritize your wife before the children. Mm -hmm. and, that, and when you do that, the children learn respect of a woman from the man and following submissively in a holy manner from the woman. Right. And they see the, why the man and the woman are equal in different roles. And they learn true love of your fellow man by watching their parents. That's right. That, that's one grace that was always with us is that between Colleen and I, we always knew that we will be the example for our children's relationships. I'm blessed also to come from solid parents. My parents are yeah. from Belize and my dad's a strong alpha male leader. My mother is a, a great uh, counterpart to him and she is uh, she serves and she works and she's a very loving mother and so um, that's a part of why I even have a marriage the way it is but can visualize for our brothers out there who think that it's impossible that like women are there's no good women there's no opportunity there's that we can never turn this around just be you know a MGTOW guy or you're gonna be an incel for your whole life, they do, they they've never they can't even conceive the type of relationship you're describing, the one that I'm building with my family, but that is possible yep. if we just turn repent really and turn around right. a little bit from our fallen ways in this culture. We could all have this. Oh that's yes, that's what you want. Oh yes, absolutely. The uh, as you say, the the MGTO, the incel, everything else. It seems like the way to go because when you look out into the world it is so disgusting right. but my answer to that is you attract what you yourself put energy into and so if you are trying to become with all of your energy as a young man you're trying to become the man that would attract a holy virtuous um, in a healthy way submissive wife to lead your to follow you on your journey and support you well then you'll find it but you have to become the one that attracts it right yeah yep. exactly be the, thing. be the thing to have the power and so you were raised but your family you weren't catechized to the degree that you clearly are right now and so the tradition <laughs> was there right the form was there yeah. but the substance maybe wasn't there how did you come to learn so much about your faith so that you could walk it in this powerful way? Well, uh, uh, kind of a back to another seemed like a negative that was actually an extreme positive for me. When I was young, when I was, you know, five, six years old, I had a speech impediment of stuttering so bad nobody could understand me. Hmm. Nobody could understand me until I was about 10. And during that time, I was so embarrassed because everybody would just get tired of hearing me stutter. They didn't want to listen to me. I started reading and I literally read myself almost blind by the time I was 15. And during that time, I was studying the history, Britannica. I was studying Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, uh, all of the great books of the ancients because they were on the shelf covered in dust wow. <laughs> in the basement. But like I started studying, the but they were on the shelf and I was trying to not be embarrassed around other people. So I'd go hide downstairs <laughs> and I'd read. <laughs> Amazing. And yeah. it just goes to show the exact opposite of when you bring the right media into your home. Yes. My, God bless my parents for never having a TV hooked up wow. for anything other than VHS our entire life. So we watched the old Disney's on VHS, things of that nature. Right. But we never had live stream TV in our home. Wow. And that was such a blessing. And I'm doing the same to my kids. There's no reason for it. Amazing. And so I would assume they don't have screens. No. <laughs> I, my, see, I, a lot of my life between 12 and when I finally joined the Army, uh, like the week after I turned 18, 
Um, <clears throat> I spent most of my time at my grandfather's farm, which was about 20 miles away from my parents' house. And so I got a very large amount of my raising on how to be a man from my grandfather. And he wow. served he served in the Korean War, and he was a, a man of few words and strong character. <laughs> he, uh, how do you say it? He's like, if you earn the money, you can buy whatever you want with the money, but you have to earn it. So that's my rule with my kids. You want a phone, you want a screen, you want to you want anything of your own. You don't want the clothes that mommy and daddy buy for you. That's fine, but you got to figure out a way to earn it. And I'm not going to allow I don't give allowances because why would I give them a free pass to life only to have that dream that life is handed to you crushed as soon as they step out the door on their own. That's not reality. So my, they, I grew up working at my grandfather's business that he started and ran for 30 years after he got out of the military. And that was uh, window washing and scrubbing toilets. It was custodial. And doing that and farming, it's uh, I'm basically I'm raising my kids with two generations older than me uh, principles. Wow. Praise be Jesus. Yeah, you're a remnant, a true remnant. From 100 years yeah. ago. Yeah. You're, you're yeah, cut from totally. the cloth of 100 years ago prior to the you know sexual revolution. <laughs> wow. I still have my influences and my struggles that I deal with because of being in this society. We're all basting in it, like it or not. Yep. Oh, so. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, you, um, so you have this strong Catholic imprint both scripturally and uh, traditionally. And yeah. you find yourself in the army. You get married when you're in the army. You met a woman that you knew when you were 15 years old. Um, tell me about your your wife, if you will. You know, like, did she grow up in the same community, the same church? Did you guys know each other as children? Um, what was her life like? Because I'm sure a lot of the men listening, you know, you're you're the way you're living and the things you're describing seem so foreign. And so yes. it would be interesting to see what kind of imprint is on a woman that will, you know, work with you as a man this way. Okay. Um, yeah, so I met my wife, like I said, when I was 15, and uh, it was at church, but it was not my home parish. I was out in the middle of <laughs> BF nowhere. <laughs> it was 30 miles to the nearest town of 600 people where I grew up. We were in the middle of the <laughs> farmland, right? So... Uh, my oldest brother had just got out of college, and while he was at college, he had been introduced to the Latin Mass. And so when he came back and he was with us for a summer before he went off to work, uh, he started. He had found a Latin Mass, but it was like 115 miles away. And so every Sunday he would go there, and every chance I got, I would ride with him, not because I liked that I couldn't understand him, and I had no idea how to use the missile or anything else. It was for the wrong reasons. It was a bunch of beautiful young ladies there, and I was a young man. <laughs> That's why I wanted to go. <laughs> and when I, uh, one of those times, I happened to notice what my now wife in the choir, and I was just like, man, she's let's let's see where this goes because she's something special. Her uh, her upbringing was 180 degrees from mine. So they always went to the Latin Mass, but they never talked about the faith, they never read the Bible, they never got catechized, they never anything. Uh, they went to public school, they did every possible thing you can imagine secular. So they had the Latin Mass and were living the most secular life you can possibly live. Uh, daddy, uh, daddy is spineless and mommy is pants wearing in charge through passive aggression. Wow. Uh, <laughs> like, all of the above, it took us a solid five years, uh, first five years of marriage for my wife to learn how to actually express herself instead of clamming up and like hiding in the corner because you were not allowed to have an opinion unless your mom told you to have it in her house. Wow, yeah. And so that was completely opposite. I grew up farming, bucking hay, 
uh, <laughs> working with my grandfather, you know, raising garden, all the rest of that stuff. And if you have a problem, you stand up and say it, right. man to man. And so uh, it was, I think what gravitated her to me was I was not looking. I was living quite secularly on my own personal life, you know, chasing uh, girlfriends and whatnot. Even though I was in my young teens, I had matured early because of being out working with men all day, every day. And uh, <clears throat> I had written women off by the time I was 15. I'm like, they're naggy, they're opinionated, they're awful. I just hate them. They're always trying to manipulate you, right? <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, I met her, and what she says gravitated her to me was I was highly attracted to her, but whether or not she wanted anything to do with me wouldn't stop. I was on a mission. I wanted to change the world. And so she was like, I want to be part of it. It wasn't I – I never chased her. I was just like, you're awesome. I'd love you to be with me. But if that's not the case, then I'll just keep moving because I'm still moving yeah. one way or another. She bought the mission and the man came along with it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that's the power of being a man on his mission. How did you convey that mes mission to her? Very poorly for the first 10 years. <laughs> really? Oh, I guess you were 15, yeah. so you were still a kid. Right, right. No, I wasn't good at it. It was trial and error mostly. Um, it was just, uh, a lot of it was let's, uh, I'm trying to accomplish this thing, whatever it happens to be, whatever my current goal was. And right. she's like, that's stupid. And I'm like, I don't care if it's stupid. I'm going to do it anyway. And then, I uh, I would do it and it'd usually be stupid. <laughs> and, uh, I come back and I'm like, I'm sorry, I made the mistake, but here's this next thing I'm going to try. Yes. And, <laughs> and they just kept going. And eventually she learned, look, I'm going to quit telling him it's stupid. And just like, he'll never grow up if I don't let him try. That is right. Yeah. Yeah. And so very rare to find a woman that will allow you to make mistakes. Oh, it's These huge. These women think that they own you and they don't recognize that God is moving you. And you're not, she's not my God. You're not my you're God. Right. God is taking me. You might not understand. I might not understand, but I just have to do this thing. And if a woman can get behind that kind of attitude, that yeah. I got to do something and you could either come with me, you could be with me or you could be against me, but it's one or the other, then yeah. that makes for a good partnership. That's the way my wife is with me. I make mistakes all the time, and, but she oh, understands yeah. that, hey, this guy's got to do that in order to work it out. Let him work it out and get out of the way. And she's been right. really, she greatly rewarded as a result. When guys like you and I have a good track record of showing virtue, like you did, never giving up, Yeah, women are, are gladly submissive because they can trust I, you. This is a strong man. He's not going to give up. Right. And they know you're going to make mistakes, but that's how people learn, you know, especially boys of any age. That's boys have to make mistakes. <laughs> any age. I'm happy you said that. Yeah, uh, I will want. I do kind of want to throw out here one of the large, one of the biggest steps, and that my wife took in her own growth shortly after we were married um, to allow her to flourish into the mother that she is today um, was when, without understanding why, she allowed me to take back control of our finances. She was trying to do the finances of everything in the home, as her mother had always done. And I said, no, if I'm earning the money, then I decide where it goes. And that was really hard for her. But what resulted is she got so much peace from not having to deal with something that isn't necessarily her business if she's not earning it, <clears throat> but then it causes all this angst because it's like, well, then why'd you buy that burrito at work? We were supposed to be saving that for the back patio furniture or whatever it happens to be. And to you having earned it, it's like, look, I was working and I was hungry. 
So <clears throat> instead of the man always feeling like he has to justify what he's doing with his money, and the woman feeling like she has to nitpick him to make sure he doesn't waste the money he earned, she was able to step back and focus all of her attention on our first child at that time, and I was able to make a bunch of financial mess ups and figure out how money worked and now and move forward. Right. It was yeah. pretty neat. Yeah, that is so key. I don't even know where to begin. I think you and I <laughs> are on opposite ends of the spectrum because I did everything and my wife knew nothing about my finances as long as I gave her enough to pay the bills for the house. That was yep. the way it was for the longest time. She had she didn't even have to think about it. If I ever told her, hey, look, it might be a little tight, she'd say, okay, fine, it's been fine. Recently, though, I've been putting her in charge of my business bank accounts. Ah. <laughs> and she gets to watch me make bad, <laughs> bad decisions. She right, gets to see right, well, right. the other day, she's like, where did all this money go? I'm like, just let me be. Let me do what I got to do right now. It's don't worry about it. Just book it because she, she's your bookkeeper. I said, you just book it. OK, don't worry. As long as you want to categorize it for what it is on the on the books. Fine. But don't start asking me questions about why I'm spending what I'm spending, because that's how I got here. And so she gets right. she gets to learn a lesson, you know, later on in life uh, that your wife learned early on. So you're still doing it the way I'm doing it. You decide where the money goes. Yeah. She's just involved with it. Right. Yeah. You help and me that's the books. Yeah. That's, that's all I was it. saying. I don't, unless I ask you your opinion. <laughs> yeah. Unless I ask you yeah. your opinion about this money, I don't want to know your opinion. Right. It's like, <laughs> the, the difference between coffee and his opinion is I usually ask for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool, man. Yeah. And so, but as strange as it sounds, this is what makes relationships work because it's in oh, our yeah. nature as men to be that spearhead and to carry the load and to worry about those things. And it's for the woman to care for the souls of the children on a daily basis by bearing them and caring for them and keeping them yes. home. Yeah. Yes. It's just so opposite to what is really out there for most of us in secular land in the, in the fallen world here. It, it is, um, and it's really sad that it is, because we can see in our society, in politics going on today, in media, it's the lie is coming to light. Right. It really, the lie is coming to light. It's mm -hmm. like the, the, there, there's hundred thousand person protests of all homosexuals uh, I, I'm marching down the streets of Paris, saying we don't want legal homosexual marriage. We know how we're living is bad for our society really? because it doesn't procreate, but that is our choice. We, we, we're not wanting to get married. All right, stop pushing this, it on us. Just like women right. didn't want to vote. Women didn't want to sure. vote. They had to be convinced to vote by these, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who protest, these protesters. They didn't, yeah. women don't need to vote. Because it, it's no. a family votes and she yeah. gets to vote yeah, yeah. with how she raises her children. She has the strongest vote in society, a woman, because of the virtues and values she's instilling in her children. If she's actually at home and not out there, you know, making paper and, and casting votes for something that's really none of is, is less than her true value. 100%. 100%. Yep, the women are were duped into this sexualize yourself and that empowers you. Right. When in actual actually that's just an enslavement. Mm -hmm. Now that now they don't have to worry about anybody else exploiting them, they do it themselves. Yes. It <laughs> uh, and the right to vote, the right to um, uh, get jobs and careers is like why do you want to serve another man or woman? Right versus serve your husband when you know his interests are best for you. That doesn't make any sense. Right. He's working for you. Why are you working for somebody else? Yeah, that makes no sense. And how are you supposed to instill uh, your, as a parent's virtues, your 
ideas of the world, all of your life experience into your children when they're not even in your home. Right. Sun up till sundown. Right. And when they are in the home, they're addicted to the screens. <laughs> right. It just can't happen. It's it, illogical. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't it's, it's, add up. And so what no. I see in you is not just a throwback, but I see the future. I hope so. <laughs> oh, God yeah, really, I know right? so. Because there's an awakening of interest in returning to tradition. And it, it's so obvious because, the, first of all, this is basic physics. I mean, it's, it's so chaotic that people want to hold on to something stable. It's so crazy that anything that feels like stability, but also it's biblical, right? Doesn't Paul say that when the darkness is at its thickest, that's when grace abounds? Yes. I mean, it, dark is pretty thick right now. So the grace abounds and awakening in the hearts of men and women everywhere for a, tra a, a return to mainly the, re the traditional family, traditional, traditional gender family. roles. And that's what will be rebuild a traditional society, a, a pious society, a, a, a righteous society. Right. It's so freeing when you don't have to worry about all the uh, body count of your spouse, you oh, know? Right. Like the amount of emotional and mental freedom you get with that is unreal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this is but the world wants attractive. you to forget. Huh? The world wants you to pretend that doesn't exist. Or they make yeah. they say, don't worry about that. Or if you do, if you are concerned about that, well, then you're you're a weak man. <laughs> right. 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 You ha you're insecure as a man. That's the dumbest thing in my in the world. When you buy a used car, it's a little bit less secure than a brand new car. It's just practical right. thinking. Hey, it's got some miles on it. Knock down the price a little bit. <laughs> right. It's not much right. different. So you're on a bus. Could you tell me mo more about like, so what is, how is your life unfolding and, and what are you actually doing? Why do you have your family on a bus? Where are you going? What's up? Okay. Um, well, when the government shutdowns happened and my gym got closed and uh, they closed down all the churches at that time where I was at, uh, even the traditional Latin ones all locked their doors. Um, we were, I, my wife and I were like, this is ridiculous. We're not going to be able to get to Easter Sunday mass, the greatest day of hope That's of right. the entire year. And we can't get to mass. This is not right. And so we, the nearest open Latin mass we could find was almost 1800 miles away. <laughs> it was, uh, it was down by Kansas city and we were way out there in Washington. So we got in our van and we made a four day trip, <laughs> drive pretty much day and night, get all there. We had eight kids at the time. And, uh, and because of the lockdown, you were free to do that because you didn't have right. to go to your, you owned a gym. I did. Yeah. So you didn't have years. to go to the gym. So you packed nope. up your kids and said, we'll be at mass in four days, kids. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> no, That's that was amazing. Four days there and back. What was that? That was four days there and back. 1,800 miles in two days. Amazing. Get to Sunday Mass and 1,800 miles back. There's a level of freedom that uh, the lockdown brought that, you know, some people's lives got better and some people's got, lives got worse. I guess it just depended on what you did with that freedom. And you decided to pack up your family and get on the road. And so you went, to, first of all, how do you find, how did you find one open Latin Mass all the way down there? That's my question. Well, I, I, we have been searching for like two weeks. On the two internet, weeks, all just the, looking around? On the internet. Yeah, everywhere we could find, anywhere we could look, where is the Latin Mass that's open? And so you went to that last Latin Mass, and then you went back home, and right. then what did you decide to do after that? Well, I tried for another couple of weeks to uh, get people to come back in the doors to try to, you know, unofficially reopen even though we were supposed to be shut down and all the rest of that stuff but nobody would um everybody's too scared this is way back march of 2020 or whatever everybody was too scared and so we were like you know what we've been talking about all this material crap i've got an exorbitant mortgage exorbitant rent on the gym uh we've got a garage full of cool things and toys that we never have time to deal with because I work 100 hours a week at my gym. 
And so um, we were like, let's just let it go. So we sold and uh, auctioned or gave to those who needed things that we knew of, literally everything we had, put our house on the market. Uh, during that time, I had been looking for an RV, um, but I didn't find one within our price range, but I found this bus and I was like, I, I know how to work with my hands. Let's see if I can figure out how to do something with it. And so put the house in the market and headed down to SoCal to uh, pick her up and just basically recklessly toss all comfort, all security, all self-reliance in every way, just roll it up and chuck it out the window and say, God, we're, gonna, we're doing this. We're letting go of everything. You lead us where we need to go because no matter what happens, our family's staying together and we're getting the sacraments. So we're literally following what sacraments are open until things come back. And if they don't come back, we'll continue following. God bless you and your wife and your family, bro. That's uh, <laughs> That takes quite a tremendous amount of heart and courage. And uh, I just want to acknowledge you on that. It's so funny because once again, you represent sort of a, a sense of what's happening in the world. I was also looking for an RV at that time too. My yeah. life was being up, upheaved at that moment as well, like so many of ours, but I knew that a move was in store. And I was like you, you know, thinking like, okay, what if I got to get on the road? That might need to happen. Yeah. And then I started looking for pieces of land so that I could have a like a bunker. I was, I was looking yeah. into like these um, shipping container homes and how yep, like, you, know, yep. you, could, you could bury them into the ground. I was just going to buy a plot of land and just bury one of those down into the ground. And here I am like showing my wife like how to make toilet bowls out of like buckets and garbage bags and shit. And she's <laughs> on the inside. She, I know she was cringing, <laughs> but she was letting me daydream, right? And then yeah. she finds my place of residence right now, which is way out here in central Florida on 42 acres, cattle ranch, and just away from so many so many of the, the distractions of the world, but you know, of course I still have the screens and my- For sure, uh, for sure, but what a blessing. What a We're blessing. Out here. Yeah, we both kind of are doing, in a way, kind of doing the same thing, but in a different way. It's about checking right. out from the, 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 the typical day-to-day -day, uh, lifestyle choices that most people are forced to make, quite frankly. You know, they just, they yeah. don't have you know, the, 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 the grace maybe that you and I have had in our lives and the blessings in, in, in the guise of our parents. I'm able to yes. now like re, repay my parents for raising me just to be raised in a home with a mom and a dad, much less, oh, yeah. know, not much less tradition or religious or anything like that. My dad and mom and dad didn't know what they were doing. They weren't conscious of it, but they raised us in a traditional way that brought blessings into my life that I have the kind of family that I have now. So I can retire my dad and he gets to live here uh, with me on this, you know, I have a house in the back here for him. God bless you, brother. That's amazing. Yeah, God is good. God's doing something here, here with us right now at this particular time. And I think it has a lot to do with that grace abounding when darkness is at its thickest. So yeah, what would you say to someone who's, uh, you know, wanting to live a different way and make different choices and return to tradition the way that you are, um, what, what might be some steps that they could take to start making that life a reality for them? Um, first steps are admit you're gonna mess it up. That's all there is to it. You're not gonna get it right and it's gonna take time. <laughs> that, that's really it. So prioritize um, self-betterment in lifting, in fasting, in prayer, in educating yourself off of a screen through books. Go to the local library again, like people used to 30 years ago, yeah. right? <laughs> and get yourself educated on basic logic. If you're non-religion, non-religious, basic logic. Read Aristotle, read Socrates, read about the discussions of St. Augustine on how to te you teach your brain how to come to its own rational conclusions aside from your emotion. While in that process of self-betterment, start getting rid of start with start getting rid of things you don't need. 
things you don't use. If you haven't touched your bicycle, my rule when I started minimalizing my life was if I haven't used it in 12 months, I don't need it. And so if you don't ride your bike anymore, go give it to a kid down the street who doesn't have one. You know, if you have five pairs of shoes and you only wear two, get rid of the other three. And in this process of getting rid of the excess, what ends up happening is you free up all of that space in your mind that having that stuff is occupying just in the back there. Uh, and you don't even realize how much space ownership of material things takes up in your subconscious hmm. because you know you have it and you know you have to take care of it yes. and you got to upkeep it and you got to whatever, you got to move it every time you're supposed to clean the garage, right? <laughs> so right. as you start letting go of these things, your mind starts becoming more open and you start looking at the world more objectively, less subjectively through the lens of media and politics. That's where I would say to begin self-improvement and start minimalizing your life so that you are the priority of your life, not your lifestyle or your stuff. Wow. That was very clear and explicit <laughs> and very helpful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. How much would you say the frequent reception of the sacraments plays in your life today? Uh, everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it, the frequent reception of the sacraments, uh, that's, that has been the guiding light, the, the beacon of our, our, our whole marriage we're almost 16 years now wow. but uh, but it's been since uh, just <laughs> cast iron clobber you over the head into our children's brains that that is what we live for right. in our travels around the world around the United States in the past two years uh, we literally just go from Benedictine monastery to Carmelite convent to wow. stop by the Rockies halfway in between and go down to a fraternity Latin mass in uh, Littleton, Colorado, where we get to go see the Old West museums from the times of uh, Little Britches. Uh, Ralph, uh, Ralph Moody, the author, wrote all those books. It's great. Wow. So, and every bit of that, for when you get dumped, by the grace of God, we were able to all of your stuff and you, you stop looking at the world through the wrong end of the telescope, <laughs> as I like to call it, which is I have to be secure. I have to be stable. This has to be a prudent business move. And instead you read the gospel that says for every single thing you give up, whether that be wealth or horses or cattle or family or father or mother or brothers and sisters, I will reward you 100 fold. It does not say I will reward you in heaven. He didn't say that. So we have met the most amazing, uh, more sets of grandparents around this nation, beautiful brothers and sisters living their faith uh, in our journeys at these little parishes throughout the nation than we could possibly ever have met and had that experience. And it's literally because the only thing guiding us is where are the sacraments. So if that puts emphasis enough on the power of the sacraments to us, that's where we stand. <laughs> wow. It literally is guiding your steps. Yes. I think when you first emailed me, you said you were heading towards St. Pete and you wanted to know if there was a traditional Latin mass somewhere. And I sent you to Father Palka. And that yes. was the first place I ever experienced the, the Latin mass. And you've been going there uh, frequently now, I assume, and um, that's your parish in, in Tampa Bay? Uh, I, I bounce back and forth between two. One, one is uh, Epiphany with Father Palka, mm -hmm. and the other is uh, St. Anthony the Abbot Catholic Church up in Brooksville, that's and right. Father Petchy Father is the pastor up there. And uh, the only reason we kind of go back and forth is because Brooksville is 15 minute drive from where I'm staying currently, and Epiphany is an hour and 15 minute drive. So gas nice. prices are, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of St. Anthony. Yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a great, great priest, good parish. Um, I'm actually giving a speech uh, 
on the 25th at Epiphany with Father Palka's approval. So wow, that's so cool. And you're, I mean, you're, you're a kind of guy who gets around, you reach out, you have no problem asking for help or contributing. I mean, that's how we got to know each other. Um, one last question, which I, I'm surprised that we didn't get to, uh, to the bottom of yet. So you've got your wife and your nine kids you're riding on the bus. How are you making money? Ah, yeah. So uh, for the first few months, uh, my house sold, had just sold. So I had some money, it wasn't very much, a uh, couple grand. And during that time, I literally tried about everything I could think of. I tried social media, I tried making YouTube videos, I tried um, writing a book and selling it out there. I, 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 literally nothing caught on. And so for about six months, nothing caught on. And we were sustained through the grace of God by people would come up to us after Mass on Sundays and say, hey, you're, you know, you got a lovely family there. Would you like to come and park on my land for a week and help me build a fence? You know? And so we were sustained for uh, about the first 12 months, realistically, off of odd jobs that presented themselves to us at church, wherever we happen to be. <laughs> oh, man. That truly is yeah. the grace of God. Yeah. Yeah. And what... One story on that I would like to share because it was kind of amazing. Uh, we stopped at this little tiny parish in the middle of the mountains. I mean, we literally only stopped there because we were low on fuel. Like nobody even knows this place exists. It's so small. And uh, we went to, it was Saturday night. So we went for the Saturday night mass there in a little local church. And the priest, uh, it's all old people. Like there's like 50 people over 60. And that's the, only, that's the whole congregation in this in old brick church. And so I see in kids, he was like, hey, if you need a place to park, come park in the back. So I, I did. And uh, the next day he came up with obviously things he didn't actually need help with, but wanted us to stay. And so we ended up being there for uh, more than a month. Wow. And during that time of doing odd jobs around the parish, it came to my attention through one of the parishioners in a previous life for this excellent man, he had been married, non, non-religious. His wife had divorced him, taken the kids, his two sons, and uh, raised them godless, worldly. In that, he did get an annulment through the church. He converted. He ended up going to seminary. He had to get uh, a dispensation for joining the seminary over 50, right? The man's 67 years old. Um, 90 days to the day before that night we arrived at the church, his son, by my name, Nathan, had taken his own life. Man. So this man, what uh, it was God's providence moving behind the scenes, someone who is Catholic, who does love the faith, who is wealthy in the ways of children and wife, by the same name coming into this man's life to help him reach closure, it was the most miraculous experience I've ever had in my life. That was just unreal. Wow. Imagine, yeah. you know, you didn't pick up and go. You couldn't go on this amazing journey and touch the souls that you did on your path, dude. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure you know that. This has been amazing, Nate. So, uh, yeah, I want to wrap up here, but I'm looking forward to meeting you and your family. I, I, I can't wait for it, Elliot. I think we got a lot to talk about, and I think it'll be fantastic. And I'm going to have to come see that uh, St. Michael Terror of Demons picture behind you, which is one of my favorite pictures there is. I mean, St. Joseph Terror of Demons, I apologize. <laughs> Love I, it. Before getting on the call with you, I spoke with a, another uh, Catholic man um, by the name of Kennedy Hall, and he's written okay. a book. Do you know Kennedy? No, I, I've heard the name. I, I don't know him personally. Yeah, he works for LifeSite News, the Catholic News. And um, he wrote a book called Terror of Demons about St. Joseph. And it was uh, very <laughs> inspiring to me. Uh, it's called Reclaiming Catholic Masculinity by Kennedy. Ooh. So it's Terror of Demons. So yeah, it's another one of those. He's another one of those. It's a sign of the times, the zeitgeist. You know, a return to tradition means a return to masculinity. <laughs> there, yeah. is, there is no tradition without 
masculinity. <laughs> so that was that he inspired that, and that was um, I think that's associated with the book somehow. But I found the uh, the uh, the um, artist and bought a, a print. But yeah, so you'll have that's to come awful. and yeah, man. I'm it's just gonna, be gonna turn my camera for a second so you can see my water bottle. If you can see this here, where is it? There it is. That's St. Joseph. There he is, protecting. Protecting Jesus, standing on a horde of demons right there. <laughs> That's right. That's, who's That's what I carry every day. That's who's making a comeback on the planet, the divine father, the strong father. Very cool, man. Yeah, so we'll have so much to rap about, talk about, and um, my wife is also looking forward to meeting you and your family as well, so we're going to have a barbecue here and, and get hooked up, Florida boys. So I'm looking Got forward to it, man. And, uh God bless you. God bless your wife and your family, bro. And keep being a shining light here in these dark days. God bless you, Elliot. I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to talk. And uh, I, I look forward to meeting you. My, my wife and kids are like another Catholic man who's working towards trying to bring fatherhood and families back together out to the world. I'm like, yeah, this is exactly the mission we're on. And so they're super stoked to meet you and your, fa your family. That's awesome. Very cool, Nate. Will you enjoy the rest of your day, brother? God bless you, Elliot. Take care. God bless.